So I'm very happy to introduce you to the next speaker, Emanuele Coccia. He's a philosopher. He is a philosopher, as we all are, are somehow philosophers, but he is a professional philosopher. He teaches philosophy in Paris at the Haute, uh, at the Ecole des Hautes Etudes en Sciences Sociales um, in Paris, as I said. And uh, what is interesting and really very topical today, before um, studying philosophy, he studied biology and agriculture, and he now, in his books, he brings this together, and it's a really very topical uh, uh, way of approach to philosophical uh, questions and questions of our day, our, our um, uh, time. And he has published, in a way, a bestseller, uh, a wonderful book which has been translated into 10 languages. Uh, in German, it's Die Wurzeln der Welt, Die Philosophie der Pflanzen. In English, it's called The Life of Plants, Metaphysics of Mixture. We heard the sentence this morning, we all breathe the same air. So, uh, Emanuele Coccia tells us that the oxygen we inhale and is uh, keeping us alive comes all from the plants. And I think this is a really fundamental uh, departure in your, in your thoughts. So, um, yes, we want to listen to Emanuele now. So thank you so much. Thank you for inviting me. So the good so I will speak about seeds, so starting from seeds and then uh, uh, speaking about plants. It could sound paradoxical, but seeds are the most radical and pure form of existence of silence. They are silence as a form of life. I could say more. We will only understand what silence is when we will understand what a seed is. And perhaps that's the reason why the opposite is true. I mean, why silence appears to us as a seed, as something where life blossoms, emerges, takes shape. The amazing artwork of uh, David Clairwood had shown, take the human out of a forest, uh, uh, which is among others what seeds have produced, and you will experience a very peculiar form of silence as a pure necessity, as David shows. Plants seem to be the kind of beings which, which make out of silence, their life. Let us take for good, at least for the moment, the hypothesis that silence is a seed, and that the seed is the most accomplished incarnation of what we experience every time we experience silence. I have not so much time, so I will just try to develop three stories, not, not a big deal, just three stories. First of all, where this silence come from? If silence exists within seeds, if seeds are the stratification of silence, where does all this silence come from? And the answer is from the flowers. It's very simple. Second story, what do seeds do with their silence? What is silence for them? Third stories, uh, story, sorry, seeds gave silence to the world. More generally, plants made out of, uh, out of the world the sound of silence. So what did that silence make of us? And if plants gave us the presence of silence, in which part of our life do this silence express itself? Where is silence in our life, behind or under the chat and the language of daily life? So let's start with the first story, where the silence of seeds comes from, from flowers, as I said. So that's why one could say that seeds are the sons and the daughters of silence. Literally, the fruit, the product, the results of the silence between flowers. So the flowers themselves are really the greatest, the greatest masters of silence. Why? Uh, let's take a detour. You probably do not know or you forget it, but flowers are actually the sexual organs of plants. That means that each time that you are offering a bouquet of flowers to someone, 
you are offering the equivalent of a, bit of a bunch of dicks and vaginas to di of different animals uh, 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 to someone, to this person. So do think about that next time that you're offering <laughs> uh, that uh, to a person, to, to your lo loved person. What is worst is that they are disposable sexual organs that have a, an ephemeral and unstable nature. Imagine having sexual organs that are structured like your hair or your nails, or even worse, like a pimple, a faruncle, or a boil. That is something that grows independently from you and it falls away once that you have used it. Imagine that your, the, the, the growth of your sexual organ is seasonal, linked to the outside um, atmosphere. Imagine what would it mean for us to have to build new dicks and vaginas every time that we want to have sex without being assured of their permanence. So that would be to have an idea what is uh, the experience of sex from the point of view of uh, plants. Uh, but from this point of view, flowers uh, embody the main character of plant life, the fact that they are not able to stop to grow, that the fact that for, uh, for them it's impossible to move forward toward a state of different from the that of work in progress. So for plants being itself its design, not form, but production of form. The fact that uh, they always have to reproduce their own body. In a way, life as an incessant act of somatic DIY, that's a plant for a very specific uh, anatomical uh, reasons that I uh, will skip. Now, flowers have sexual organs, uh, they are uh, the instruments that allows plants to mix their own identity and produce a new individual. Seeds are the silent result of this sexual mixture. Why silent? Because the encounter between two individuals cannot be the result of a communication about the two individuals of the same species. Plants are extremely talky beings. They communicate a lot to each other in order to tell, for instance, to their companions that an enemy is coming from is coming, just not for sexual um, uh, uh, events. When it comes to have sex, they stop speaking with their partner. Why? Because they are fixed organism. They do not move. They do not try to seduce their partner through their voice or their singing like birds or through the magnificence of their body. They literally ignore them. Instead of that, they speak to others to insects or to animals. The variety of forms and colors used by flowers is a way to communicate with insects or with other animals. If you want, it is an extremely amazing invention. Instead of producing complicated discourses in order to seducing people of the same species, uh, they prefer seducing being belonging to other kingdoms. Flowers attract insects who then put literally in communication and in contact the male and the female. It is as if, in order to seduce a partner, we would start speaking with our dog, or with a mushroom, or with a plant. <laughs> Think about that. Next time that you're looking for a partner, don't open Tinder. Just try to talk with a bee. Apparently, it works very well, at least for plants. <laughs> there is already a first lesson to take from this uh, uh, fact. The silence among partners produce a lot of visual music and communication among different species. Plants speak much more to other species that, or to individuals that belong to other kingdoms than to other individuals of the same species of kingdom. That is, an interspecific communication is probably possible just when we start uh, being silent among ourselves. We should stop talking so much to each other, to human beings, if we want to, to talk with all other animals and living beings. The silent sexual life of plants uh, is extremely interesting, and if I dare to speak furthermore, just a little bit, about the, those very strange habits, it is not because of my perversion, or not just because of that, but because uh, of purely scientific curiosity of if you want just, be, be, uh, just because of the love of silence. First of all, this silence among the individuals of the same species uh, 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 
sex, because of that, sexual life is among plants not a private or intimate event between two individuals of the same species of different gender, but a sort of public, interspecific orgy. Let's try to, uh, uh, let's try to think what would be our sexual life if in order to have sex with a man or a woman, we would need the intervention of an elephant or an oak or a lion or a bird. It would be change a little bit of the scene, actually, of, uh, uh, of, the, uh, 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 of, this, of the sexual event. But in this case, sex is a place where species uh, meets, meet. Sex is not the space of production of identity, but the necessary union with the world in its diversity of forms, statuses, substances. Insects, wind, water, animals of different sorts comes, come together in order to produce diversity. The second point is that flowers are silent beings because they are the exact opposite of consciousness. Consciousness is an instrument of interiorization of the world. It miniaturizes, so to speak, what goes on outside in order to control, to allow a decision. It's, it's an instrument of taking power over space and especially over the future and I uh, bet the neuroscientist uh, to be uh, 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 gentle with my uh, simplification of uh, 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 consciousness. A flower, on the contrary, is the construction of a trompe l'oeil space, uh, a pure appearance that does not serve to internalize the surrounding world, or not to master it, um, uh, but to produce a pure surface of conjunction of arrangement. There is, in a flower, a sort of exposure to the exterior world, to chance, to the decision of others. They are, flowers are si silence because they are structures that put the destiny of an individual and of a species in the hands of another species. If you think about it, the relationship between flowers and bees or insects is a very strange form of upside down agriculture in which flowers force bees to become their geneticists, to make decisions about their genetic, genetic destiny, because it is insects that decide who mates with whom. And the gesture of flowers to put their genetical destiny in the life of other species uh, uh, is interesting because this decision, or the choice of bees, of insects, consent, concerning which flower has to mate with which other flowers, are based not on a rational calculus, but on taste. Uh, not on utility, um, but on the content of sugar. Oh, thank you so much. Thank you. That means that uh, the result, so seeds, are what comes from the silent sexual union among flowers, uh, are literally aesthetical objects. That means that evolution is nothing, that, uh, nothing but fashion within nature. The sort of catwalk which is lasting millions of years uh, where a species let wear new clothing to other species. Each seed is a, an equivalent of an artwork. Every landscape could be, or every uh, uh, space uh, where you see flowers, so those flowers are the product of this aesthetical choice of uh, bees, uh, so in a way it's a sort of multi-specific biennial uh, an installation of art uh, made by insects uh, for other, even other species. Enough for this uh, story, for the first story. The lesson we can draw is very simple but useful. Silence is not the absence of communication. It is the space where communication overcomes the frontiers among species. If we need silence and if we need to learn the very special art of silence of plants, it is because we really need to invent new way of communicating with other species, not just dogs or cats, because we are doing all the time this kind of very strange dialogues, but also with wolves and bears, not just animals, but also plants, bacteria, viruses. We have to speak with all species to invent other languages. That will be, or that would be the sound of silence. Now the second story. If seeds comes from this silence, from this very strange communication among different species, uh, what do they do with this silence? They are, so the answer is very simple. They, bird, they build the world. Silence is the sound of the world, which is building itself from itself. 
It sounds, again, very strange and paradoxical, but you know, philosophers love paradoxical. But it is not, actually. I will tell another story. For a long time, and we all know this story because Christian theology told us a very similar one, a very similar story. So for a long time, in order to explain the perfection of the world, its magnificence, its complexity, we used to think that it was an amazing work of art, the biggest and the most perfect work of art in the universe. So it was Plato, the one who told uh, us uh, first the story, the world would be created by an artist, a divine artist, a demiurge, a technician, uh, who took the chaotic matter of the universe and put within it uh, the shadows of, or the silhouettes of the eternal forms living in heaven. So this theory is amazing, but it has some problems. First of all, it is extremely anti-economic because in order to justify the perfection of the world, you are presupposing a much more perfect entity. So it's the problem with the theory of creation. In order to explain that the world is a wonderful place, you uh, presuppose that God is existing, which is much more perfect. So it's, uh, it's not a very, very uh, uh, economic way of thinking. So first problem. The second problem is the fact that uh, the world in this case is not perfection in itself. It is the image of perfection. Third problem is that the world in this uh, uh, story is not rational in itself. It cannot think. It is just the object of thinking of someone, of this super subject, which is God, the artist, and so on. And just human being can think, but just because we have a special relationship with this divine artist. So in a way, if we still think that uh, this kind of stuff is not thinking, or a bees, or, or flowers are not thinking, it's just because in part of these stories. So again, this theory, uh, against this theory, some philosophers of antiquity raised their arms and took the seeds as, mass, uh, as, as an example of an embodiment of the most perfect and sophisticated form of consciousness, rationality, and language in the universe. What we call word, they said, is just the result of those seeds spread everywhere in the body of the universe. Now, why? It's very simple. What is a seed? It is a piece of matter which is able of, uh, uh, out of itself uh, to produce forms and very complex ones, very complicated ones, without the help of external agents. It is, in a way, creation in its process. Or more precisely, a seed is the perfect coincidence of the artist, the process of creation, uh, the matter used during the creation, and the result of the creation. Because the plant is not the, just the uh, external product of the seed. It's just the transformation, the metamorphosis of the seed. So the gen in this story, in this model, the genesis of the world is not a unique event occupying a special place in the timeline or anterior to time. It is an endless process of, the hist of history which takes place through forces which are within the world, immersed in matter, and not external to general process of the becoming. The seed is the evidence of this kind of absolute uh, uh, immanence of creation, because, as I said, the subject, the object, the medium, and the process of generation coincide. Uh, in this uh, 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 model, in this story, the creation is silence, uh, because it is not a form of communication. The idea, the word, coincides perfectly with its result. That's the second lesson. Silence is not the absence of language. It is a very special way of existence of language. We make experience of that every time that we are, for instance, talking with our dogs. Uh, uh, we are not communicating with dogs. We are just commanding them, producing command. And in a way, commandment and laws are this kind of silent word that do want to coincide with their results. In seeds, you do not even need to hear the word in order to let something happen. The word and the event just coincides. To make our life the sound of silence means, therefore, to reduce the space between words and reality. 
to let our language become seminal, a force which gives, uh, which gives uh, form to our life, to our body, to our community. Uh, have I time to, to tell just the third, sorry, two minutes, three minutes? Yeah. So very quickly, the third story. Uh, um, seeds and plants made something special which has a very close relationship to silence, which is our personal experience of silence. They gave to the world the possibility of breathing. As you know, we can breathe uh, just because uh, plants put oxygen in atmosphere. Every time that we breathe, we are in contact with plants. Or more specifically, uh, spe specifically we are in contact with, um, actually with the byproduct of the life, with a kind of sheet of plants, which is uh, even more interesting as an idea. So what is breathing? What means to breathe? It is at the heart of all of our experience, because I speak about that because yep, also to, uh, tomorrow morning uh, spoke about that. It is at the heart of our, all of our experiences. It is not a substance. It does not hold within itself in the nature of things, nor it is a late, uh, a late echo added once to the experience is com accomplished. Without it, without breathing, uh, nothing would be possible in our life. Uh, everything that comes to us has to mix with breathing, to take place within the activity of breathing. Even I'm speaking, but I have to breathe within that, in a way. Breathe is the first activity of all living being, the only one that can claim to melt itself with being. It is the only work that does not tire us, the only movement that has no end uh, other than itself. Our life begins with a first breath and will end with the last one. To live is to breathe and embrace in one's breath all the matter of the world. In brief, in brief, the time of an instant, an animal and the cosmos are enjoined and sealed within a different unit than the one that marks being or form. It is especially with and in the same motion that the living being and the world consecrate their separation. What we call life is this gesture through which a portion of matter distinguishes itself from the world with the same force that we, it uses to confuse itself with it. So breathing is this kind of dynamic. We take a portion of matter and, uh, of the world and we transform it into a part of our uh, body and the other way around, we take a part of our body each time that we are breathing and we transform it into a part of the world. Uh, to breathe uh, means to be immersed in a place that penetrates us with the same intensity as we penetrate it. Plants have transformed the world into the, the reality of breath. Silence is then the experience of penetrating the world and being penetrated by the world and its spirit. That's the third lesson to traverse the world and to become, for an instance, with this same spirit, the place in which the world becomes individual experience. From this point of view, silence is not the end of the world, it is the breathing of matter. Thank you. Thank you. So this is the moment where the contributions we have heard today start to uh, somehow uh, yes, come together and um, there is a fertilization idea anyway. <laughs> and uh, yes, thank you, uh, Emanuele, for this uh, very original journey for our thinking, and I, I don't know if Mr. Singer has uh, something to say. No. <laughs> so, <laughs> and um, yes, I open up questions, comments. Thank you very much. It was brilliant. Uh, as you said, 
if uh, we would have an intervention of a third party of a lion during sex and that it's not really existing like that. But then you spoke about breathing and with each breath we connected uh, to a forest, to the oxygen to, of the plants which are producing. So maybe there is some bigger pattern of action on this planet and everything is uh, connected on a much more complex way which is invisible for us and is not direct. What do you think about it? About I didn't hear the first part of the question actually. Ah, well, um, I said that, uh, wouldn't you think that there is a bigger pattern of interconnection yeah. on the global level? Uh, if course. you look at the breeze, stars, moon, uh, I don't know, water, it all affects us on a physical level. And maybe yeah. there is an intervention between human beings and it's not all based on our decisions. I know, of course there is a huge part of uh, connection in the sense that, first of all, uh, what... Um, we tend to uh, forget it, but what Darwin uh, demonstrated is the fact that uh, life is actually unique. I mean, uh, uh, the life that uh, animates us is exactly the same uh, life that animates apes, which is exactly the same life which animates the species which generated the apes and so on. So the fact that every, every species uh, comes from a previous one, uh, and the relationship between species I is in a way the same relationship that you have between uh, a caterpillar and a butterfly means that there is really exactly the same species every we have the same species of uh, the same life of every species on earth there is a very very uh, beautiful story of one of the first uh, um, well, of the most important ecological thinker uh, in uh, the states uh, called aldo leopold uh, who published a posthumous book, which is called The Almanac of a Sounty County, of Sounty County. And within it, there is a story called Odyssey, uh, Odyssey, which is a sort of rewriting of Homer's Odyssey, but from the point of view of an atom. And the idea is that, uh, that uh, in a way, uh, Leopold is just following the life of this atom, which is reincarnating first uh, in a rock and then uh, in a, a grass and then in a cow and then in the Indian, but it's exactly the same matter, and that means that it's exactly the same life. And the moral of the story, the message of the story is that we have to, uh, he says, we have to uh, live fast and die often, which is a very, very beautiful uh, idea of life. But what is interesting is in this story is that uh, we can ground uh, our respect for other living beings and for Gaia in, its, uh, in, general, uh, in general, not because they are different from us, but just because everything here, every living species, uh, is the archive of our past and future life. So in, in a way, every life is the reincarnation of the same substance, which is the substance of Gaia. So we are just Gaia, we are just the Earth, which is trying to take another form within our life. Each of us is, in a way, an attempt of this planet to live differently. So that's, it's much more than interconnection. We are the same life. We are the same matter everywhere. So. Give another big round of applause for Emanuele Kocha.